Hi, I'm Graham Blackburn and this is Traditional Woodworking by Hand. And with this episode, we're starting a new series based on one of the many books that I've written. And this is about the very first thing that you need to know, measuring. Most people have one of these. This is known as a tape measure. And while these are great for carpentry, they're not really good for woodworking. First of all, why is it called a tape measure? Well, because it's a metal tape. But I want to point out that originally, before we invented these, we had real tape measures. Here's a tape measure. It's cloth. It comes in a leather case. This was actually my father's. Uh, and these are pretty good. They're all marked in inches. Eventually the end wore off. So you simply always start, you know, put a pin here to stop the tape going back in the, in the case and just subtract one. So those are tape measures. But why did I say this is good for carpentry? Well, it's because the end of these has a little nib that slides backwards and forwards in order to allow you to take supposedly accurate inside measurements and outside measurements. But since almost everybody in the world does this, sooner or later, this little thing that comes backwards and forwards makes the holes wider and you no longer get a measurement that's exact enough for woodworking. Whether you're using a small 16 foot one, or whether you're using a really big uh, 50 foot tape. The other reason that this is not really good enough for furniture making is that the measurements are all painted on. The painted marks themselves have a width. That's not really exact enough. It's good enough for carpentry, but it's very often not good enough for woodworking. So what do we do? Well, traditionally we've used wooden rules. Now, I know that America is one of the last places in the world to use metric, but whether you're using a metric rule or an imperial system inches and feet rule, uh, a folding rule, is much more exact than one of these. First of all, it's made out of boxwood. And boxwood, as you probably know, is one of the slowest growing trees or woody trees there are, with the result that the annual rings are much closer together. And although every piece of wood in the world will shrink or expand, grow larger or grow thinner in order until it's in equilibrium with the ambient moisture content. And the only way you can avoid that is if you bury the piece at the bottom of the pyramids. Nevertheless, because the grain is so fine, these stay relatively the same. The other reason that this is good is that the actual markings for the distances are not painted on, but they're incised in. So whatever you use to make your mark here, I'm using a chisel, but I could be using a marking gauge or a marking knife. I can actually, boom, this will fit in absolutely perfectly, right? So these are good for those two reasons. They don't move that much and it's easy to transfer the mark exactly. Now, this is a traditional old fashioned English fourfold two foot rule. They also come really minute if you're doing really small stuff like this. This one will open. Or they come even longer. Here's a, a three foot one, right? These are all made out of boxwood. They all have incised measurement markings so you can take an exact marking and they stay relatively the same. They certainly don't move over the course of the time that it might take to build something. One other interesting fact, and even though now in Britain, which has gone metric, these are now uh, metricized and they're no longer in inches, they're in centimeters and millimeters and whatever. There's one peculiar reason. If 
these folding rules are made in Britain, like this one is. You can see it says here, made in England. The markings start on the left-hand side. Now, I find that convenient because I'm, like most people, I'm right-handed. And so if I hold it like this, I can measure and I can see, oh, this is two inches, right? For some unknown reason, or at least unknown to me, American folding rules are numbered from the other end. So I think that's an interesting thing to bear in mind. But whether you're using inches, imperial inches, or whether you're using more up-to-date uh, the metric system or whatever, whether you have a small one, uh, whether you have a really tiny one, or whether you have a big one, this is mostly the thing that I use to take measurements, if I've actually got to measure things. Now, I want to point out something else. There are, of course, a few other more detailed measuring devices, uh, such as this metal measuring device here, which will give me inside measurements and outside measurements, if I've really got to be exact. But in general, the point that I want to make is that if you understand the proportions of both the joinery and the actual piece that you're making, I prefer not to use a measuring device like a rule at all. If I know, for example, and I've said this before, that in general, the strongest possible form of any joint, any two or more pieces of wood that are put together, is that where you remove the least amount of wood possible equally from all the parts. I can demonstrate that with a, a, a two-piece joint here. Here's a joint that you use if you want to join two pieces of wood together like this. You know, it's just a dovetail joint like this. If I had a long piece here and a long piece here, this would be the joint to join these two pieces together so they don't come apart. Now you'll notice that they're both exactly equal. If this piece were bigger, yes, it would be stronger, but it would necessarily mean that this piece would be smaller, right? And weaker. So bearing that in mind, that determines how you proportion a joint. That's one of the things that you need to know when you're doing joinery, and we'll be talking about that. But if you have a basic understanding of the proportions of any kind of joint that you're using, I find it's a lot easier not to use any measuring device at all, because it adds another layer of time and tools uh, where you can make a, a mistake but I prefer to use the joint themselves. Here is a little sample mortise and tenon. Now, a regular mortise and tenon, very typically, is divided into thirds, right? So here's the tenon here. If I make the tenon to that basic proportion, then I don't need to measure it I can simply use it to me measure where I'm going to make the mortise. If I actually measure this, it turns out to be, oh, one and two inches and a sixteenth plus a little bit. That's a hard thing to measure here, but I don't need to do it if I use this piece of wood to mark out that piece of wood. I don't even need to know what it is, apart from having the proportions, right? I can simply measure the width of the, ten of the mortise by whatever the width of the mortise tends to be. So that's another thing to bear in mind. Whenever possible, I don't actually measure, whether I'm using centimeters or inches or, or, or whatever, I use the wood itself. Now, Let's talk a little bit, uh, since we're in America, one of the last places to use feet and inches. Uh, let's look at this British one that starts with the measurements here. As I said before, I find that easier being right-handed because now I can see what's happening. I can use it as a marking gauge. I can do whatever. 
There are advantages if you have American ones that are numbered from this end, um, because now uh, you can do this and it makes it sometimes easier to hold whatever marking device you're going to do. So that's up to you, whether you use a British one or an American one, whether you use feet or inches or whatever. And, and by the way, why is it feet and inches? Well, supposedly, I've read that many centuries ago, um, even the ancient Egyptians used a foot, a human foot, as a basic unit of measurement. Later on, the Romans came along and they gave us the inch. The inch is the English corruption of the uh, Latin word for twelfth, uncial. So we have feet and inches. Now there are other interesting stories about that. In After the Romans left Britain uh, in 360 or whenever it was, when the last legions were recalled to Rome, uh, Britain was taken over by all sorts of invaders from the continent and it took a few hundred years for things to get back to any kind of normality. But at one point, um, what is now England was divided into separate kingdoms and the one in the middle was called Mercia and there was a king of Mercia um, called Offa. Um, Offa is mostly famous for the fact that in order to stop his courtiers from being sycophantic, he had them carry him down to the beach one day uh, and he sat in his throne and he commanded the ocean, the tide, not to come in, which of course it did, and that was his lesson to them. But he's also equally famous for having started to standardize what a lot of these now called imperial measurements are. A hand was his hand. The first joint in his thumb was an inch. A foot was his foot. A yard was from here to the end. He was the guy that established all those things. Now, of course, we don't, if you're going to go metric, you don't need to know that. But I find that, that, that kind of interesting. There is another reason why I tend not to actually use measurements. And of course, almost everything that you make, there are invariably there are what I call givens. You've got to make, someone wants to make a table and it has to be a particular height, or they're going to make a cupboard and it has to fit in a particular alcove. So there are givens that you can't do anything about. But one of the secrets of making furniture that looks good is that if all the dimensions that comprise the piece have some kind of relationship one to the other, and these are called paradigms. And you learn about paradigms if you go to architecture school or art school or whatever. And um, we're not gonna get into that right now. But basically, the idea is that whatever the measurement of one part is, it should have some relationship to all the other measurements here. There is yet another thing to bear in mind, which is that from a practical point of view, assuming that you understand the givens and assuming that you understand uh, how everything should relate, uh, I find that it's equally useful not only to measure one thing by something else that you've already made, but I find it really useful to measure according to the tools that you're going to use. Here is a quarter inch mortise gauge, uh, a mortise chisel, sash mortise chisel. And you'll notice that this is the chisel that I used to make that. Now, whatever I may have decided in measuring the width of this or the length of this or whatever, if I had also borne in mind that this is the chisel that I'm going to use, it makes it a whole lot easier. And I don't need to measure the width. This is the width. I lay it out and this takes care of it. So just another example of why I don't always like to actually measure. I want to show you another couple of tricks before we move on. Uh, but before we do, I want to point out that a lot of this stuff that I'm talking about here is included in this second of a whole series of books that I've written. And if you go to my website up there, you can see all the books that I've written. 
the first one, they're in, they're in a series of five. The first one is about all the different tools, what they are. The second one, which is what this is, is about how to tell a good one from a bad one and how to make sure that it works. So in this second volume here, there's a whole chapter on measuring, which has a lot of information that we've used here. Uh, and I just want to show you a couple of tricks from this. The first trick is what we call pinch sticks. You don't need to actually have a tape. It can be hard to measure, say, the width of this box here. It can be hard to measure whether the box is perfectly square. But look what you can do with pinch sticks. If I make a couple of pinch sticks and I point the ends, I can put the ends into the corner like this. And now by making sure that the ends fit in here, and I hold that tight, if I then turn this around, this is a quick way of making sure that now the box is perfectly rectangular. I can also, of course, use pinch sticks the other way. I can use pinch sticks instead of a measurement to now I've got the length of the box. Here I've got the width of the box. I mention this because there's a lot of ways of actually measuring without recourse to whether it's the imperial system or the metric system or whatever else. And one last trick that I want to show you is something that people don't know too much. You've got to measure a piece of wood and here's a piece of wood that measures, if you look closely, this measures seven and a sixteenth plus a little bit. And say I wanted to divide that into three equal parts. Well, using a tape, whether it's centimeters or imperial measurements, that can be difficult to do. How do you divide seven and a sixteenth and a little bit into three equal parts? Well, the secret is that you don't. If you take your folding rule and you put this flush on the end and you move this to an even multiple of three, now I can take my marking knife or my pencil and I can mark three and I can mark six and now I have the piece divided into three equal parts. Just one example of many that you can read about in the book of how you can measure things without having to use a measuring device like a rule or a tape measure or a cloth measure or whatever. One other last thing that I want to point out is what's known as a framing square. Now this is typically a carpenter's tool and you'll see that it's full of all kinds of measurements. Very few people know what that is unless you're a really trained carpenter, but it's how to measure overhangs and eaves and angles and things like this. But it can still function in a furniture shop as a really nice square and you can still take off measurements and you can see that the measurements here are also incised. So you can come down and perfectly make the mark. So I hope that was useful. If you want to learn more, as I said before, by all means, go to the website where you can look at the books and also, while you're at the, wood, at the uh, website, you can find out how to come and take lessons. Because I not only do these classes, but I teach at uh, different woodworking schools throughout the country. And I also enjoy teaching in this shop, my own shop here in, in New York. Uh, and the easiest way to arrange that is simply to give me a telephone call or drop me an email. And I'd be happy to work something out and you can get your woodworking really up to par. So thanks for watching. Uh, I hope that was useful and entertaining and I look forward to the uh, next installment of what's coming down from the Woodworking Hand Tools book. Thank you.